All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for the second time to many of you who I said good morning to an hour ago. Um, but welcome to the 2023 Epilepsy Connect Symposium. I'm Sarah Klein. I'm the CEO of the Epilepsy Foundation of Colorado and Wyoming, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here. And if this was a wedding, and this was what, the groom's side and the bride bride side, I don't know, one side is more popular than the other. But um, I just want to tell you briefly about the Epilepsy Foundation. So our work can be summed up in three simple words that you see all over the place. Connect, which is in the name of the conference, educate, and empower. So we connect people to each other, people with epilepsy, parents of people with epilepsy, we connect them to each other. We connect them to healthcare providers. We connect them to resources and information that can help make a difference in their lives. We educate people about epilepsy in places like this. We educate in seizure first aid and recognition. Um, and then we empower people with epilepsy with information, knowledge, resources um, to live their best lives. We do um, advocacy in a lot of different ways. So that's what we do. And today is just a way that we bring all three of those things together, connecting you to each other, connecting you to resources and um, in the community, uh, educating you with new, hopefully new information. Um, and I hope that when you walk out of here today that you feel empowered to take the next step in your epilepsy journey, whatever that looks like. So um, I'm delighted to welcome our keynote speaker this morning. Before I do, I wanna say another quick uh, thank you to our sponsors who have made today's conference possible. Our gold sponsors for today are Charlotte's Web, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Pharma, and SK Life Science. Those are our gold level sponsors today. So say thank you to the sponsors, yes. So I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Lori Sandler. Lori is the primary caregiver for her middle son, David, who was diagnosed with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, which is a rare type of intractable, intractable epilepsy. Um, she is a life coach, a speaker, and an essayist. She writes about her experiences dealing with the challenges of David's care and her own personal journey of growth, which can be found on her website, lauriesandler.com. Um, she also runs a support group for parents of adult children with neurological challenges. So please join me in welcoming Lori Sandler. Thank you very much, Sarah. How's the volume with the, the mic like this? Y'all hear me okay, great, thanks. Well, good morning. I'm curious to know how many of you have tried meditation or meditate on a regular basis? Okay, that might be about a quarter of you. Well, those of us who meditate regularly know that meditation is not all peace and bliss. Very often we sit and watch our minds spin in a cascade of thoughts. And I was sitting and meditating not too long ago when, and I was having exactly that experience when one thought landed in my head and there was silence. It was, I swim in a sea of worry. What I was worried about at that time was my son, David. David was on four seizure medications. He was still having seizures. He wasn't sleeping well at night. He was sleeping too much during the day, irritable when he was awake, not eating well, not sleeping well, or sorry, not drinking well. And these were all the side effects of the medications that were supposed to be controlling his seizures. Now they were controlling them to a degree. He certainly was having less seizures, but his quality of life was terrible. David is diagnosed with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, LGS. It's a very rare type of epilepsy. Only about one to 2% of individuals with epilepsy have LGS. And those that do have many different seizure types, they are recurring and they're resistant to treatment. So that's drugs, that's surgical interventions, diet, whatever you throw at these seizures, they're very resistant. Along with the seizures, most individuals with LGS have some form of intellectual disability and very often a co-occurring disorder. So David is also diagnosed with autism. He does not speak. He has no formal method of communication and he needs full assistance with all of his daily living activities. So that's dressing, showering, toileting, and eating. Is there anybody in the audience who has a family member diagnosed with LGS? 
That's, that would be my family. <laughs> That's how rare it is. How about family members of individuals diagnosed with any other type of epilepsy? So it's a handful of you. Uh, how about individuals with epilepsy yourself? Again, a handful. And if you want to look around to see each other and maybe connect during the symposium today, please do. Uh, lastly, how many people here are clinicians or other healthcare providers for individuals with epilepsy? That's maybe a quarter of the room, right? Well, whether you have epilepsy yourself or you are caring in one way or another for somebody with epilepsy, we all deal with the worries and the stresses that come along with the disorder. So I'm going to be sharing with you all today some lessons that I have learned from my son in the 29 years that I've been his mom and caregiver. And they're going to be in the areas of acceptance, self-compassion, and meaning-making. But before I go into these, I'd like to give you David's history. I'd like to let you know what we've been through. So David was diagnosed with infantile spasms when he was eight months old. Later on, this became the diagnosis of Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. Infantile spasms is diagnosed by a signature EEG pattern on the, bre the, uh, the brain wave, which is called hypsarrhythmia. Along with that, the infants have spasms, uh, seizures that occur in spasms. And for David, those spasms were head drops. So when I would hold him up on my shoulder when he was about two months old, he started dropping his head on my shoulder. And I thought, well, that's odd. At this stage, he had neck control already. And when he'd lift his head up, he'd have his fingers in his mouth and express some irritation. And again, I thought, is he teething? That's really young at two months old. So um, as time went on, David became irritable. He needed a lot of rocking and soothing. His eye contact wasn't so great. So we went to the pediatrician and unfortunately he kind of pushed me off as a nervous mom saying, well, this child isn't uh, similar to your first son. So he's a little irritable. Let's just watch him and see if he meets all his milestones. Well, by the time David was about five, six months old, sitting in a high chair, those head drops were so obvious, just boom, right down on the tray of the high chair. And he'd lift his head up and laugh. And he would do this five, 10, 15, as many as 20 times. Here I am thinking, okay, this is a very unusual game <laughs> for a toddler to be playing. So back to the pediatrician we go. And eventually, by the time he was eight months old, I do not recall why it took that long, he had an EEG and they saw that signature EEG pattern, the hypsarrhythmia, and he was diagnosed with infantile spasms. Along with the diagnosis came a prognosis of a 95% chance of severe neurological impairment. So at that point, it was like the race was on. Okay, we got to stop these seizures and get this child learning and developing so that perhaps he could slide by on that 5% chance that he would be fine. So at the time, what was recommended to us was a strong steroid called ACTH as the, the first course of a treatment. Along with steroids comes an increase in appetite. So here is David two months later, and about one and a half times his weight. In addition to the weight gain, there were two other side effects we had to watch for, hypertension and an ulcer, stomach ulcer. So I basically had to learn to become my son's nurse. I learned to give him twice daily injections of this steroid to monitor his blood pressure every day, and also to test his stool for blood, which would be a sign of the ulcer. A few weeks in, he did indeed uh, test positive for an ulcer. So we had to add an ulcer medication. And then a couple weeks of that, his blood pressure went sky high, necessitating that we taper him off 
the ACTH. And as we did, we added um, a seizure drug that's very popular, you've probably heard of it, Depakote. And during that period of tapering the ACTH and being on Depakote, David was seizure free for five weeks. That may not sound like a big deal, but in his 29 years, that is the longest period of his life that he has ever been seizure free. And during that time, we saw developmental gains that were incredible. He started bringing toys to his mouth age appropriately, crossing the midline to grab things. He was approximating words, baba for bottle and dada for daddy. So of course we were very excited. Unfortunately, the seizures came back after the five weeks, the developmental gains significantly slowed down. So we added, we tried another medication. We tried the ketogenic diet. We tried high, vi uh, high vitamin B6 therapy. None of these things were helping. So it was suggested to us to see if David was a candidate for surgery, as some of you heard about this morning. This is back in 1997, where the only way they would determine this is by doing brain surgery and putting electrodes directly on the brain. So we did this, um, and I have a photo here of David about one or two months after that surgery. Unfortunately, they could not determine a single focus of the seizure, so he was not a candidate for a resection. So we went home with a lot of data uh, about his brainwave activity and a list of more drugs to try. Here's David a year later at preschool wearing his first helmet because now he's walking and falling. It's a very cute helmet when you're a little guy. The helmets are not so cute when you're older, a teenager, an adult. They were wonderful at the, the preschool. Of course, he received um, occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy. They tried to teach him a method of communication, the PEC system, where you look at pictures and touch them, uh, sign language. But David's ability to focus and look was impaired. His uh, fine language skills weren't so great. So he had great difficulty learning. Um, I, I, I used to tell people, to me, I think it's kind of like uh, learning a lecture on the radio and there's a lot of static on the line. You're gonna have a hard time picking up that lecture. With infantile spasms and LGS, there is a regular brain wave activity hap happening all the time in the background, even without the seizures. So we moved on uh, to trying alternative uh, things at this time, um, energy work, spiritual um, interventions, herbs from Belize, from South America. We traveled to Brazil to a famed spiritual healer there, to Eastern Europe. This is years going on. We were trying anything we could as long as it wasn't going to hurt. Um, we also tried the vagus nerve stimulator, which was discussed earlier this morning. This is David with his brother. Now, back in 1990, whatever this was, 20 some years ago, the VNS was a larger device. You can see in this photo, a bulge on the left side of David's chest, that's the device. For those of you who are not familiar with it, the vagus nerve stimulator is like a pacemaker that's implanted in the chest with a wire that wraps around the vagus nerve and it delivers regular impulses to the nerve that is then meant to calm the seizure activity in the brain. Unfortunately, it did not help David either. So here's David at 14. And the reason I have this photo here is because the look of his eyes. Not only are they objectively beautiful. <laughs> there is a depth to my son's eyes that um, just show not only that there's some intelligence there that he's not able to communicate, but wisdom 
There is wisdom in his eyes. And I have heard so many stories of individuals who could not speak, who learned to type years later, and it was shown the level of intellect that they have, not only age appropriate, but for some of these individuals, even beyond their years. So I encourage anybody in this room who interacts with someone who's nonverbal, please give them the respect they deserve for their age. You really don't know what is going on behind those eyes, even if they've had cognitive tests that say their IQ is such, or they're at a second grade level or third grade level. I'm sorry, I'm sure there is much more going on there that that person cannot communicate. And here's David and me uh, last summer at a wedding, my nephew's wedding. David was honored to be in the wedding party. He, I think it's the first time he ever wore a suit. <laughs> and uh, I want to point out his goatee. Now, of course, he looks sophisticated, but that goatee, unfortunately, is the, the result of a seizure. He had a seizure a few months before the wedding and had a big gash at the bottom of his chin. So I wasn't able to shave him for quite a while. And so thus we went with a goatee rather than the full on mountain beard, which just didn't seem to suit David. So that's an overview of our story. It has been a lot and um, I'm still smiling. So there's hope. Uh, but what I want to focus on is the first 10 years of David's life. Those 10 years were an all out battle against this epilepsy monster to stop these seizures and get David learning. And during that time, all I could see was what was wrong. It was as if I had blinders on. I, I only saw what was not working and what needed to be fixed. And that brings me to the first lesson that I have learned, acceptance. I love that I found this sign here, enjoy your journey. <laughs> <laughs> acceptance is not a one and done kind of thing. You know, all right, I've, I've accepted this, let's move on. My life, our lives are constantly giving us things as situations that we don't want to accept, that we don't like, that we are resistant of. So it is indeed a journey. Actually, I'm gonna stay on that side for a little bit. So after the vagus nerve stimulator was removed, we had it in for about two and a half years and then decided to remove it. I went to visit a friend of mine who ran a holistic health clinic. She was the one who was introducing me to energy healing and spiritual healing, all of that alternative stuff. So I went to her one day, um, exasperated. You know, what are we going to do next? Do you have another idea of something we can try? She was silent for a little while. And she then <laughs> leaned in and said, Lori, you're going to need to gain acceptance of David's condition. I was not happy to hear that. <laughs> this was, of course, 20 plus years ago before the mindfulness movement was as popular as it is today with words of acceptance and letting go and being present to what is. Back then, the word acceptance to me meant giving up. And I was not about to give up on my son. So I walked away feeling pretty perturbed with her, but the word acceptance stayed in my head. A couple of days later, I was driving by David's school. I got stopped at a light and I saw before me walking across the street was a group of kids from David's school. Now I didn't know any of them. I didn't recognize them, but I knew they were from his school because they looked different. You could see there was some neurological or physical impairment. And I know this sounds terrible, but when I saw them, my heart sank. I thought these are my son's peers. I didn't want them to be my son's peers. I wanted his peers to look like my other two boys' peers. 
I wanted them to be the kids going to tennis practice and performing in the school play like my other boys. As I sat there and was thinking this, I realized how crappy I was feeling at this thought. So I remember I had my hands on the steering wheel and I literally said aloud, what more can I see here? And in that moment, I saw something I had not noticed before. I saw the aides walking across the street with the kids. I saw humanity. I saw people helping kids who needed help. And it softened my heart. I thought to myself, this is something my son and his peers do for the rest of us. They bring out our humanity. And then I thought, is this what acceptance feels like? So the first tool I have for you is acceptance. Stop and acknowledge what is. I love that in the story, I was stopped at a stoplight because it reminds me, we really do need to stop. If we're just going, going, and not really paying attention to how we're reacting to life circumstances, we never have an opportunity to see things differently, adjust our, our perspective. And that's the second part. When we recognize we have resistance to what we see, try to drop the resistance and we can see a bigger picture. You know, science tells us that our awareness is taking in millions of bits of information literally in every second, but we only see a very narrow uh, amount of that information. I think part of it is biological because we need to focus on what, you know, what, what might be threatening our survival. But the other part is what we're thinking. If you recall, I said it was as if I had blinders on. I could only see what I didn't like, what looked like it was wrong, what needed to be fixed. And by dropping the blinders, dropping our attitudes, we literally can see more of reality. I also see that there is a third part to acceptance, and that has to do with judgment. So during that time, um, when, when it was this all out fight against the epilepsy monster, my critical voice, we've all got one, was working overtime. And it would say things to me like, you're not doing enough to research a cure for David. You're not doing enough to keep him safe from falling. You're not doing enough to uh, challenge him to grow. And as I was holding this word acceptance in my mind, I realized, wait a minute, I am beating myself up here. I need to accept myself in addition to the situation that I have been resisting. So that brings me to the next lesson, which is self-compassion. So on one particularly hard day with everything that was going on with David, I needed a break. I stepped aside. I closed my eyes and I said, please help my son. I don't know what more to do for him. And I, I want to pause here and say, whether you are somebody who prays or you only believe in what your five senses can tell you and your mind can figure out, I want to say that there is value in asking for help and asking questions. Whether you ask these of an individual, of your idea of God or the universe, or just nobody in particular, there is value. Why? Because when we ask questions, it takes us out of our thinking mind. It opens us up to our intuition. It opens us up to our subconscious, when we sleep and have dreams, there may be answers or clues to the questions we've been asking. It also opens our awareness up to the synchronicities, those magical things that happen in life when you're holding a question and then you meet somebody who leads you to that answer, or you open a page in a book or listen to a podcast, and there's something that speaks to directly, directly to you know, that which you had in your mind. So there is value to asking questions. So on this particular day, when I did, 
an answer came to me. And the answer said, okay, but you need to help yourself first. Somehow I intuited what that meant. I put my hand on my heart and I offered myself compassion. I acknowledged to myself what a difficult day it was, what a difficult month, year it had been, and how I was doing my best while you know caring for David and raising two other boys, not getting much sleep at night. So I acknowledged the situation I was in. I offered my own self understanding and then kindness and compassion. So this is tool number two, self-compassion. Acknowledge your personal experience. Offer yourself kindness and understanding. And when we do this, it calms our nervous system. It relaxes the sympathetic responses of fight, flight, and freeze. When we do that, we move from a closed energy state to a more open state, from a fixed mindset of, you know, this is terrible, to a more growth-oriented mindset. And that brings me to my third area of lesson, which is meaning-making. Individuals who have a growth mindset look for value and meaning in any circumstance and in their life in general. Now, the reason I have this picture here is it is a piece of pottery that was created using the art process called kintsugi. It's a Japanese process. Is anybody familiar with kintsugi? A couple of you. Basically, it's a process of taking broken pottery gluing it back together and filling the cracks with gold. And, and you're creating a, an art, a piece of artwork that is more beautiful than the original precisely because of its cracks. You've taken something that was broken and making it into something that is beautiful. And this is a great metaphor for our lives. How can we capitalize on our flaws, on our quote unquote brokenness and make of it something beautiful? There's a wonderful quote I love by the late Leonard Cohen, singer, songwriter, poet. There's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. And so using this piece of pottery as a metaphor for David's life, I asked myself, okay, this is a broken brain. It doesn't work as brains are supposed to work. What's the goal here? And at first, for many years, I felt that my son was cheated. His older brother is a singer, songwriter, musician, so talented. His younger brother, likewise, has a gorgeous singing voice and it is an incredible artist. What were David's gifts? I couldn't see them. I really felt that he was cheated. But as the years went on, and I saw these amazing lessons that David was teaching me, not only of acceptance and self-compassion, but many other things that led to a better quality of life for me, I saw my son as a teacher. That was his goal. So I also knew he was not only teaching me, he was teaching his brothers, he was teaching his family members to become more empathetic and caring and sensitive, not only to David, but as other people in their lives who may look different. So I wanted to know, well, is he teaching other people? So I asked his two caregivers, what have you learned from having David in your life by caring for David? And I got some answers. The first caregiver, I have learned to see the world with more vibrancy and detail by figuring out what David is staring at. It brings a meditative appreciation of the world. I also have a new appreciation of how much a person can say without language. And the second, one of the biggest things is mindfulness. David helps me to just be and feel and appreciate every moment rather than just letting it pass or waiting for the next one. So my son, who does not speak, 
who does not have any formal method of communication is teaching something that sages have been teaching for millennia, mindfulness, appreciation for life. Tool number three, meaning making. What is the goal that creates beauty from what seems broken? And you get to, to decide the meaning of circumstances. So for many years, I was pretty angry at what I saw. I saw my son didn't get the same uh, opportunities as my other boys, boys, but as time went on, I saw something very different. So uh, it can take time. And the meaning that we strive for might be a bigger meaning. So for myself, as I was learning these tools from David, I wanted to have more meaning outside of my home, my circle of friends. So I became certified as a life coach and I worked with other parents. But still, I wanted to share what I was learning in a bigger way. I didn't know how that was going to happen until one day, about two years ago, one of my sisters was visiting from Los Angeles. She is an award-winning fine art photographer. She was taking family photos, as she always does when she visits. And on this particular day, she lowered her camera, got silent, and I knew something was up. And she said very slowly, can I do a photo documentary of you and David? And then I was the one who was silent, imagining photos of David and me out there in the public. And I was in fear at the idea of it. But I, I let it settle for a little bit. And I realized, oh, maybe this is a vehicle for greater meaning, not only in my life, but David's too. And so I said, yes, not knowing, you know, where it would go, where these photos would go. Well, I'm going to show you some of the photos, but before I do, this really did get big. My sister has won several awards for the photos. She's getting recognition from the photography world. The photos have been displayed in China, India, about to be in London and across the United States. And we just closed a five-month exhibit here on the Anschutz campus, sponsored by the Epilepsy Foundation, where we had about 40 photos on display. I gave four talks there, um, one of them along with my sister. We also did a panel discussion discussing art and disability. We had nearly 1,000 people come through. These were clinicians, researchers, students, professors, and the general public. I've seen people stand in front of these photos with tears in their eyes. Caregivers have told me how they feel seen by looking at these photos. And that's caregivers of individuals with varying uh, ailments, elderly, young children. Students have told me how the photos remind them why they came to med school in the first place, why they're working so hard. So um, let's get to some of the photos. This photo is called floor plan because when I was looking for the home we're now living in, I was looking for an open floor plan so I could see David wherever he was and keep him safe if he had a seizure. So here I am in the background in the kitchen. David, of course, is in the foreground. He's on the couch in the living room. And I love the angle of this photo that my sister took with David's eye there. It makes me wonder, what is he thinking? Something I'm often wondering. This is David on that same couch, mid tonic clonic seizure. I'm gripping his left hand to try to pry his fingers apart because his grip gets so tight. Even though I cut his nails short, he can uh, tear his skin in the palm of his hand. I'm also counting very slowly to myself the length of the seizure. David's seizures, fortunately, are only about a minute, but I always want to know how long they are. So I'm counting one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. And that is the title of the exhibit my sister chose, one, 1,000. In this photo, I'm putting cream on David's back 
but I chose this photo to point out the watch and the ring that he's wearing. The watch is called an, uh, an embrace watch. It's a seizure watch. It monitors um, repetitive activity. And if it detects a seizure, it calls me, which is wonderful. I'm always around him during the day or a caregiver is, but at night, I have a camera on him. I have a monitor in my room with the volume turned all the way up. So I will usually wake up. All these years I've been very sensitive to hear his seizures. But if I miss a seizure, that ring is going to, I mean, the watch is going to call me. So it's very reassuring. Now the ring is called an aura ring, which is not intended for epilepsy. It's intended to monitor people's sleep. So one of the things that it monitors is heart rate. And um, as Dr. Mayan said earlier this morning, David's heart rate spikes when he has a seizure. So he might have a tonic seizure, which is just stiffening, not the rapid movement that the watch won't pick up. But in the morning, I will go and check the data from the ring and see if there was a spike in his heart rate. I know that I missed a tonic seizure. In this photo, you see David with the helmet he's wearing these days. He's also wearing a harness. About two years ago, David's seizures became more serious, uh, drop seizures uh, when he's awake as opposed to seizures when he's sleeping. So whenever we go out, he's wearing that helmet and the harness that was developed by the brother of a woman with drop seizures, it has a, a handle in the back. So I, have, I can prevent him from falling down when he has a seizure. This photo speaks to the lesson or the tool of acceptance in two ways. One, that I have had to accept him going out with a helmet and a harness. Before the seizures became so bad, I never wanted to put the helmet on David when we went out for walks. I didn't want him to stand out. I didn't want him to feel different, but I've had to accept for his safety that he needs to wear this apparatus all the time now. The other aspect of acceptance is what happened that spring and that summer I typically have a few caregivers, part-time caregivers who help me out. That spring, I, I lost several of them. We were down to just one part-time caregiver. And it's challenging to find the right caregiver to care for David. So I decided that spring, I was not going to go crazy searching for somebody. I was just going to let things be. Even though I had resistance at first, I was not happy that I had to care for him as much time as I did but I decided I was gonna accept my role. And we spent the summer uh, packing a lunch, a book as you see, we went for lots of walks and easy hikes that David could do and spent time at the park near our house. So it, I really like leaned into acceptance big time that summer. This photo speaks to self-compassion. Self-compassion very often equals self-care. I normally don't let myself nap during the day, but as you could see, I needed to nap. And it's kind of funny because David's usually the one napping and he's awake here, but my sister caught me out cold. <laughs> this is the last photo I'd like to share. It's titled Walking This Life. I love this photo because it gives me an opportunity to see meaning. I see myself here as David's mom and caregiver, holding his hand as we walk down the sidewalk. And I see David as my teacher, holding my hand as the student as we journey life together. Our story is one of many untold stories of epilepsy and long-term care. If this is your story, I hope that you have felt seen and perhaps understood in the telling of our story. The personal truly is the universal. And whether epilepsy is your story or not, we all face challenging times in our lives that call on us to grow. We have the choice to heed that call or resist. But the next time you are faced with that choice, I hope you'll, re you'll remember these lessons that I have learned from my son, the lessons of acceptance, self-compassion, and meaning-making. Thank you. And this is uh, both my website, if you're interested, I have essays there of 
things that I have learned along this epilepsy journey, and that is my sister's um, uh, website where you can see all of these photographs and many more. And on the epilepsy table, I have a business card if you want to have something to take home with you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Workshops will start in about 10 minutes. Thank you.